Hello. So at the end of my talk, uh, as part of the conference in Mexico City the other day, I, I realized that you guys really wanted to know a lot more about the psychology of emotion. I, I felt I kind of let you down on that front a little bit. So I offered to create a little video um, where I do exactly that. Talk about emotion a little bit and um, try to give you some, some real tips about the relevance of emotion in the classroom and, and what you and your students can do to, to help. Um, yeah, to maximize learning and to not let emotion get in the way. So what I'm going to recommend, I'm going to tell you ahead of time and then I'm going to kind of do it with you. I'm going to recommend that you kind of do two things for your students. Uh, the first thing will be to explain to them how emotion really works. Uh, what the physiological and psychological processes are that ultimately give rise to an emotional state. Um, I, I then want you to kind of explain to them that emotion gets in the way of learning, that learning works best when you're in a relaxed, non-emotional state. And therefore, um, it's really good if you're able to control these emotional states and, and have an ability to um, take control of your own body and your own mind uh, in, and put it in the place where it's able to learn well. Uh, so finally then, I'm going to tell you a technique that you can use to give your students this skill. Because just like all the other skills I spoke about in my talk, learning to control your emotional states is a skill. And it only develops again through repeated structured practice. So I'm going to give you a sense of what you can do with your students to impart this skill. Um, and I think it's a very practical, relatively easy thing to do. Okay, so that's my goals. So let's just jump in and we're going to start by really unpacking emotion and trying to give you a real good sense of, of how emotions come about. And that all starts here. All right, so we often, of course, think of the brain, but when it comes to emotions, the, the brain we call the central nervous system, but there's all this connectivity between the brain and the rest of the body, all of your organs and your muscles and basically everything else in your body. And that system that connects the brain to the body um, is, is something that we call the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is in the brain. The peripheral nervous system is how the brain talks to the rest of the body. And it, and it talks to the body, I guess you'd say, through hormones. But it doesn't really talk, per se. What it does is switch the body between two different states of being. Okay, And that's what we actually have depicted here. Something called the parasympathetic mode and the sympathetic mode. You can think of these as, as sort of two different channels, I guess, or two different ways of being for our body. They're both concerned about survival, but they're concerned about survival at different time frames. Okay, so specifically, let's start with the parasympathetic. Any time that your body is relaxed and you feel secure and comfortable, your body will enter this parasympathetic mode. And in this mode, what it's mostly doing is digesting the food that you have in your system and delivering all the nutrients and oxygen and other you know, useful components to your body. It's, it's essentially doing maintenance, much like you might do to a house when you, know, you realize something's in disrepair, you repair it and fix it. Um, and if you keep your house in good repair, it will last for many, many years. That's kind of the mindset of the parasympathetic mode. Let's keep this body strong. Let's keep repairing it. Uh, and that will allow this body to live on for many, many years. Okay, so it's long-term survival this is thinking about. Now, let's, let's kind of think back to caveman days because that's where this system that we're going to talk about actually evolved. And it has a, a alternate personality, as it were. If you're in relaxed mode, and let's imagine we're cavemen sitting around a fire somewhere, perhaps relaxing with your other caveman buddies, and suddenly we hear the roar of a predator somewhere, okay? So we know there's a predator somewhere around us. 
immediately our body will go into what we call sympathetic mode. And, and let me unpack this a little bit. We have a little part of our brain right around here called the amygdala. Um, and the sole job of the amygdala is to sense danger in the environment. So it's attending to all the information that's coming into our bodies. And if it senses danger, then it flips a switch and we go into sympathetic mode. In sympathetic mode, what you would feel when this flip, when the switch gets flipped is you'd feel your heart rate increase, you'd feel your respiration increase, you would feel strong, you would feel alert, you would feel ready for action. So we, we often refer to this as the fight or flight mode. Um, and that's the idea, by the way. The idea is there is danger in the environment around me. My brain has just sensed a threat, has sensed some sort of danger, and I may have to act. And specifically, I may have to confront that danger, fight, I may have to take it on directly, or I may have to run away from that danger, flight, get out of there. In either case, I want to be strong and I want to be ready for action. And so what this mode does, by increasing your respiration, increasing your heart rate, you get more blood pumped um, to the rest of your body, so your muscles get lots of oxygen, lots of strength. You get adrenaline released into your system and cortisol. Cortisol makes you um, more resistant to pain. Adrenaline makes you ready for action. Uh, and so your body is now in this mode. If, if you've ever heard stories of mothers being able to lift a car because their child got trapped underneath, that's the sympathetic mode. Okay, And that's what it's there for. It's there for short-term survival or some short-term emergency. So it's meant to be turned on and then off again. Once the emergency is passed, you should go back into sympathetic mode and relax. Okay, now... What does this all have to do with emotion? Well, um, just to be clear about that, this is the current psychological theory which says that the emotions that we feel, the actual emotions, are a function of two things. One is what I've just told you. It's that kicking in of the sympathetic system that makes us feel, it, that's the starting point of an emotion, okay? Suddenly feeling our body come to life. And so the claim is that happens first. So your body is ready to fight or flee. But what happens shortly thereafter, very shortly thereafter, is your brain starts to do what we call cognitive appraisal. It tries to figure out why is my body, what is it that triggered my body to be like this? Uh, and, and notice that it need not necessarily always be a scary or threatening thing. You might have gotten a lottery ticket and you might be reading the numbers and as you're reading the numbers and you see the winning numbers, you're realizing, I've won. I've won the lottery. This also kicks in our sympathetic nervous system. Okay, this 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 is it's it is a it's weird to think of winning a lottery as a threat, but it kind of is. It's a threat to your normal way of being. It's like your life is about to change dramatically. And that is enough to stimulate the the amygdala, and that's enough to get your sympathetic nervous system engaged. But in this case, of course. When you're, when you're kind of thinking about why do I feel like this? Well, you feel like this because something really good just happened. And so the emotion you feel would be called, you know, excitement or elation or whatever. If it's a bear, though, that got your heart beating, now the emotion might be fear. So the claim is you feel that activation of your body. You think about this current situation you're in, trying to understand what caused that activation. And then once you kind of figure that out, this results in a certain state, okay, of, of emotion. Um, and, and it could be worry, it could be fear, it could be anger, it could be whatever. So, you know, just to think of fear versus anger, for example, a bear would tend to make you cause fear because uh, you've got your whole system active, but you realize that bear is tougher than you are. This is the appraisal part. If the bear is tougher than you are, you're going to feel fear because you feel in danger. But imagine instead it was, it was something that you are tougher than and it's threatening you and you're thinking, I can kick this thing's butt. Well, now you might feel anger. Okay, If this was a rabbit roaring at you or something, you might get angry at that stupid rabbit and you might be ready to fight versus flee. Right, So you might feel anger, not fear, 
etc. So the important point of this is the emotion one feels starts with that sympathetic nervous system activation, but then becomes an emotion when you kind of think of the situation it's in. Okay. I think the really important thing for classroom um, thoughts is this. When you're in fight or flee mode, you are not in a good state for learning. This is a state for action. Um, and the other point I want to make is we use examples like bears um, and stuff, uh, you know, really scary examples. But any threat can make this system active. So in the classroom, that threat might be more like social embarrassment. Um, like, for example, if you asked a student to answer a question about something they were supposed to have read, but they hadn't read it, um, now when you look at them, you are threatening them um, in a sense. You are, if, if you ask them to answer that question and they can't answer it, they're going to feel like they're letting you down, they're going to feel stupid, they're going to feel embarrassed, and so when you're scanning the room thinking about asking somebody, they are feeling that threat just like the bear and they can be feeling that emotion and that is not productive. It gets in the way of learning. What we would like is to turn that system off and to get students back in the parasympathetic mode. How do they do this? Okay. Well, again, one of the things I, I recommend to you guys is what I just explained to you, explain to them. Because knowledge is power. So understanding how these emotional states come to be and why is really helpful. Um, then it comes to a question of how do you control it? Too many people make the following mistake. When they feel anxious or fearful, they try to tell themselves, stop feeling anxious. Stop feeling fearful. But they're not, we're not very good at stopping the sympathetic mode by just trying to stop that, ang uh, that feeling. And so we quickly learn that we're not controlling it. Uh, and that makes it even more scary. And so there becomes a bit of a negative cycle where an emotion can kind of run away on the person because they feel like they can't control their emotions. They feel like they can't control it because they typically do the wrong thing. If we go back here... They typically try to say, stop the sympathetic system. However, a better thing is to turn on the parasympathetic. You can't be in both modes at once. If you focus on relaxing, you will naturally turn off the emotional state. Okay, But you can't do it by thinking about turning off the emotional state. You do it by thinking about relaxing. How do you relax? That sounds great, right? Oh, sure. All I have to do is relax. How do you relax? Learning to relax is a skill. Just like the other skills I told you about. And there are relaxation routines you can go through with your students. And one of the recommendations I make to you is to maybe imagine once a month taking five or ten minutes from a class to do this with your students. And what is this? Well, all this involves is going through you know, across a bunch of steps and you start with the, the sort of student's head, let's say, and you just ask them muscle group by muscle group. So you can start with the face as it suggests here to, to, to tense the muscle, tense it, tense it, tense it, as tense as you can make a muscle, tense it and turn it to really uncomfortable and, and then relax. And when you relax it, let that all that tension go. Let the relaxation go and feel that relaxation. And while you're feeling that relaxation, say a word over and over to yourself. That word will be your relaxation word, whatever it might be. Mexico, I'm saying tequila. <laughs> so every time I try to relax, I say tequila, tequila, and I relax. Now we move to the next thing, the arms. Tense your arms, make them as tight as you can, you know, try to tense everything, your fists, everything as tense as you can make it, feel how horrible that feels to be tense, and then relax everything. Let it relax. Feel that relaxation, tequila, 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 relaxation, tequila, 
and you keep working through the body, shoulders and chest, tighten them, relax them, feel the relaxation. Stomach muscles, tighten them, feel the relaxation, all the way down to the legs. When you do this with your students, first of all, they will love it. Their body will feel very relaxed, and it feels like you have just you've had a nice massage almost. Um, but the important thing is they're feeling what relaxation feels like, and they're associating that with the word. And if they do this on a regular basis, then that word becomes a tool for them. When, they're, when there's emotion involved in the classroom, and if you saw this, for example, you could see a student being an emotion, emotional, and you could tell that student, use your trigger word. Come on back to us. Come on, relax. You're, you're, you're upset right now. Remember, we talked about emotions and how they come about. Your, your students probably shouldn't use the word tequila, <laughs> but I imagine tequila, tequila, tequila. Relax, relax. Come on down. Okay, cool. Excellent. Now we're ready to learn. Okay, so, our, so your students could all use that. In fact, at the beginning of every class, you could start by using the trigger words and getting everybody relaxed and in a relaxed state. Um, if you do this over and over again, you will be teaching your students an extremely valuable skill. Because, I mean, it's just like when we get in arguments, for example, the reason arguments get so stupid is because we get so anxious. Um, we get so sympathetic mode, and we can't think well, and we don't make good decisions when we're in that mode, and so we say things we shouldn't say, and things go crazy. If instead we can learn to relax, use our word, then we can be the cool one, the, the, the one who's able to respond rationally even in highly emotional situations. And that's a great skill for your students to learn. Okay, I hope that helped a little bit. Um, I just wanted to do a quick video again to touch on some of those things. If you have any questions, you can find me online, I'm sure. Feel free to send me an email. Okay, thanks and thank you again for the, for the really great experience of speaking to you all in Mexico City. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Okay, bye-bye.